And now for our prayer of illumination. As water splashed across the face awakens us in the morn, may your word awaken us to your presence. Wash us in your wisdom, bathe us in your goodness, refresh us with your grace. By the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. And if if able, please stand for a scripture lesson. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you are baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus beyond that. I do not know whether I baptized anyone else, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I hope that if there is one thing you take wholly away from this worship service, it is that we mean what we say in the bulletin when we say that children are welcome in worship in all of their wiggly, squirrely glory, right? We believe that God is able to love us in whatever state we're in on any given day, and sometimes we need squirrely kids to remind us of that. And that brings me back to where I was a few weeks ago, when on Baptism of the Lord Sunday, I read to you from Girl Meets God, a memoir by Lauren Winner, where she retells the struggle she had preparing for her own baptism. In the same chapter, she talks about a night when she and some other college students helped serve cake. At the Clare College Chapel in Cambridge, there was once a baptism of twins. I didn't know the twins or their parents, but I went to the baptism anyway. It was an evening service, and afterward there was a special dinner for all the baptismal guests and everyone else who had been at church. There were, waiting to be cut, four or five sheet cakes, all gooey white icing on top and orange marmalade inside. A few of us students busied ourselves at cutting the cakes so that when the time came for dessert, there were 200 square pieces neatly laid out on small blue plates. It was tedious work. It was also, I thought, the most important thing I had done all month. Cut cakes for those babies' baptisms. More important than any history I had studied or any magazine articles I had written or any prayers I had prayed. It was the drudge work of the church, and it seemed the best work in the world. Like sweeping the church or setting out the hymnals or making sure the sacristy held enough candles for the week's services. The holy work of God's people somehow. 
I told my priest, Joe, that I wanted to spend my whole life cutting cakes to celebrate babies' baptisms. I was, Joe said, an altar guild member in the making. Sometimes people wonder how babies can be baptized. Indeed, that very wondering is the genesis of the Baptist church. Baptists believe that babies shouldn't be baptized. They say there's no scriptural precedent for it and that Jesus and John were both baptized as adults. Hannah, who's a Baptist, often says that a baby can't promise to do everything one promises in baptism. I've never found this a very persuasive argument. It strikes me as too individualistic. The very point is that no baptismal candidate, even an adult, can promise to do those things all by himself. The community is promising for you, with you, on your behalf. It is for that reason that I love to see a baby baptized. When a baby is baptized, we cannot labor under the atomizing illusion that individuals in Christ can or should go this road alone. When a baby is baptized, we are struck unavoidably with the fact that this is a community covenant, a community relationship, that these are communal promises. I don't know about you. Baptisms have a tendency to make my eyes wet. And it doesn't seem to matter how many of them I do. It just keeps happening. But I struggled when I opened the lectionary in the series that I had chosen for this month and read the scripture in which Paul says rather scoldingly to the church at Corinth, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you, well, except for people that I did. Because that's a struggle for me. You see, in my office, uh, just as in my father's office before me, there is a little sort of bluish black book called a pastoral record. It looks much like a ledger book you might have found in uh, a store or a bank before computers took most of that on. And in that pastoral record, there's a section for baptisms. And I, I have to tell you, I can't wait that book open and to write in Britain's name and the date to add who have allowed me to be part of this beautiful moment in their faith journey. I'll have to thank the people whose baptisms I've been a part of. And I'll remember their faces and the conversations that we had and the places that I served when I baptized them. And I'll hold them in prayer because I got to be part of that moment, not just in their life, but in the life they joined on that day. To me. And with standing here and holding Walter to pour the water into the font and holding Britain to pour the water over her head and then reading Paul's words, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. But perhaps it helps to understand the situation to which Paul is responding. Remember, I said that the church at Corinth had a lot of divisions. There were socioeconomic divisions. There were divisions based on gifts. There were also divisions based on allegiances to leaders. Christians and, and, and people of faith seem to be really, really good at dividing ourselves up. Right? Christian history is, in a lot of ways, just sort of a memorizing of divisions. That the East and West Church divided, and then we divided into Romans, Roman Catholics and Protestants, and then we divided among the Protestants into denomination after denomination, and it's like a dizzying number of denominational variations. I used to work with a senior pastor who used to call it like the Baskin-Robbins 31 flavors of Christianity. I think 31 might be an underestimate. We're good at dividing up. Even within 
my own lifetime, I have watched as United Methodism has begun to divide itself up and stick labels on ourselves. Labeling whether we were traditionalists or progressives or centrists, whether we have a tendency to read and follow folks like Keith Boyette and Rob Renfro, or whether we have a tendency to listen to Adam Hamilton, or whether we have a tendency to be paying attention to voices like Jarrell Wilson and Pamela Lightsey, we begin to divide ourselves up. And we're not the first. Folks have been dividing themselves up, it seems, even since the days of Paul. For word has gotten back to him that arguments in the church at Corinth had begun to happen over who follows who. Well, I was baptized by Cephas. Well, I was baptized by Apollos, and he says, well, I was, a pap I was baptized by Gaius, and he says, and so they begin to form little tribes and to argue and to lose their identity. And then Paul says something that strikes me as strange. As he's listing off all of these ways that people identify themselves, and it, it's clear to us that it's wrong to identify ourselves by who baptized us, right? Maybe that's just the itineracy of United Methodism. But then he says, and some of you say, I follow Christ. Wait a minute, what's wrong with that? What? That seems like the right answer, doesn't it? Except I follow Christ. I think sometimes we need the reminder of cutting cake for baby baptisms. I don't follow Christ. We follow Christ. Our Somos del Señor. Now it may seem weird in this context in which uh, that I'm aware of very few, if any of us, are native Spanish speakers, for us to, to theme the entire series around a phrase in Spanish, Somos del Señor. says, somos del Señor. We belong to Christ. One of the things that we lose when we translate the Bible into English is that um, we use you as both a singular pronoun and a plural pronoun. And I have been fighting for a long time to get a Bible that uses y'all. <laughs> it's an and and it means y'all as a group. Because too often we take texts in which it's written to y'all and we read it as though it's written to us individually. And, and we're prone to that, particularly as Americans, we live in an individualistic culture, right? We, we focus, and I do this to my kids, right? All the time they will hear me say to them, you worry about you. Right, when they start getting in each other's business and tattling and trying to uh, boss each other around, I will shut it down with this terrible, terrible phrase, you worry about you. Is that true, Charles? Do I say that to you? Do I tell you to worry about you? Yeah, I'm getting dirty looks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, it, it it's a tough life being the preacher's kid. You never know when mom's going to pick on you. But we do this, and we, we have this idea that, that we're in charge of ourself and nobody else. And we allow that in our minds to also mean that we're supposed to do this on our own. 
We make it a point of pride to be independent, capable of taking care of ourselves, and whether that means physically or spiritually doesn't seem to matter. Baptism has a way of undoing that nonsense if we do it right. In baptism, we're reminded that we're not supposed to do this by ourselves. Part of the work of baptism is to allow ourselves to be initiated into community. Part of what Ryan and Amy did when they stood up here is they offered you all their trust with the most precious thing that God has ever given them. And I know that they did this with Walter, too. They bring their children and say, help us. Help us raise these children to know God's love. I don't know if you could hear what I was talking, saying to Britain as I walked her up and down the aisle. I have a tendency to turn off the microphone because babies like to play with them. But as I walked her up and down the aisle, I encouraged her to look into your faces. And I told her, this is your family. These are the ones who will pray for you. These are the ones who will remind your parents when you are on their last nerve that you are a beloved child of God just exactly how God made you. These are the ones who will lead you through snack time and craft time and sneak you an extra cookie and show you what it looks like to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And what I could have said as I walked her up and down the aisle is that she, too, will show you what it is to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. We're still waiting to see how, as her beautiful little personality emerges and we get to know her better, as words come and she begins to toddle about the sanctuary, she will show us in new ways what it means to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ because I don't belong to God. We belong to God. We do it together in a way that defies all the sensibilities of our Midwestern pioneer American spirit, because we are those who have been baptized in Christ, who have entered into covenant not only with God, but with one another so that we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. Friends, on this beautiful day, as we welcome this new sister in Christ and remember our own baptisms and the covenant community into which we were baptized, let us give thanks to God. Amen.